Okay, again, I'm Dr. Hunter Peterson, naturopathic physician here at Coeur d'Alene Healing Arts, and this is Open Forum, and the topic I have excitedly come to share about with you all today is sleep. So sleep, when I look at health, I, in the work with all the people I work with, I look at the main determinants of health is what I call them. And in helping people in their healing process and trying to understand suffering, the determinants of health are something centrally that I examine with my patients and that we look at together because in my belief system, if we are optimizing the functionality and practices of the determinants of health, then there's very little reason for disease or suffering to exist. Because I inherently believe that the body is intelligent and designed to be in a state of health. So I have an article I wrote all about all the 12, I call them 12 determinants of health. You can read that. It's actually downloadable on our website um, and here in our clinic in, on paper. But one of the big health determinants to me is sleep. Um, I feel it plays a massive role in our health and well-being. And it is something that most people don't really know a lot about it. Um, the physiology of sleep, our current scientific understanding of it. And then, you know, depending on the quality and well being of our sleep process, what's going on when we're not happy with that, when there's a dysregulation? And how do we understand that? How do we correct that? What tools do we have? at our disposal. <clears throat> and so there's going to be a lot of topics that come in here and I'm going to do my very best to hit as many as I can. Um, but I, yeah, I just have a lot to share about what I've learned about sleep over the years, both personally and as a clinician. So I am going to start us talking about the physiology of sleep and the understanding of what's really going on when we're asleep. <clears throat> so let's break it down. Um, we have two main types of sleep, which kind of are not really well described, but in terms of a definition, but I'll just tell you it's the, the, the demarcation is REM sleep and non-REM sleep. Okay. So the sleep that we start with is the non-REM sleep. And that sleep is broken down into four categories. So stage one of non-REM sleep is that kind of, it's, it's almost not a stage because it's almost a momentary occurrence, but it's the transition of wakefulness to actually sleeping. And it's kind of the mechanism through which the body shift, shifts gears from being in conscious thought where we're, quote unquote, in control of our thoughts and our brains to becoming unconscious and being disconnected from conscious wakeful thought. So it's, it's almost like kind of a moment in time. I'm not going to spend too much about that. Although many sleep issues do arise. <laughs> with difficulty falling asleep. In fact, many of them, both the first time we fall asleep or if we wake up in the middle of night and we don't easily fall back asleep. So that phase one of non-REM sleep is really where we're in a, a stuck pattern. And I'll get to talking more about that. So after we quickly shuttle through phase one of sleep, we go into phase two of sleep. And phase two of sleep, of non-REM sleep, is kind of where we do, like, the metaphor I use is like, if you've had a busy day at work and you've, you know, gone through like 200, 300 emails or 200, 300 documents, 
in, unless you want your desk or your email to get totally unruly, you got to go file all that stuff. You got to go put it in the right place so you know how to access it in the future. Otherwise, you, you lose track of it all. And so that's really what's going on in phase two of non-REM sleep is you're archiving everything. You're sending experiences, thoughts, memory, feelings to the kind of appropriate parts of your brain and um, kind of communicating them around so that they can be deposited. Um, and these are a lot of like more executional, rational, intellectual parts of our life experience. They're less to do with our emotional kind of spiritual, you know, integration process. So that's kind of a little bit of a distinction, but that that phase and phase two of non-REM sleep is really what's happening there. Um, our bodies, you know, this is the quote unquote, someone already asked a question. We've heard these terms, deep sleep, light sleep, and REM sleep. This is where we would categorize the light sleep. So our body can still be in motion, and and um, but we're we're doing all this filing and you know housekeeping of our thoughts. Then phase three and phase four kind of go together. I forgot when I read more deeply about this the exact distinction, but we'll just put phase three and phase four of non-REM sleep together. This is where we are going into that quote unquote catatonic deep sleep. And our, our body actually goes into a physiological paralysis in this period, in this cycle of sleep. And you're really the way I like to think about that is like everything is going into paralysis that your body can put all of its resources into literally restoring the brain physiologically. So you can think about all day long, we're using our brain, we're thinking a lot, we're just, you know, humans have these over complexified minds and we're creating a lot of clutter and debris in our, in our brain tissue and in brain fluids as we go through the day. And at nighttime when we sleep is the golden opportunity and crucial time that our body detoxifies all that clutter physiologically, all of those waste products, toxins, debris literally gets, you know, scrubbed off of our neural tissues of our brain cells and structures so that our brain is able to engage fresh in our conscious wakefulness the next day. And literally what happens is our brain cells shrink um, to about 30% of their normal size in this part of the sleep cycle. And all of these fluids bathing our brain kind of move through almost as a detergent and scrub all the surfaces of the cells off and remove all of that toxicity of, of neurotransmitter byproducts, et cetera. And then our bodies in paralysis while this is happening. And that's where in that so-called deep sleep. And then what happens is we actually cycle all the way back up to phase one. So you could say transiently for a moment, we wake up again. And sometimes with dysregulated sleep patterns, what's happening here is you're actually, you wake up and you don't go back to, you don't cycle back into that phase two, then phase three and four. And so um, that is a kind of, you know, problem that happens with this you know, dysregulated sleep is sometimes when we flip back into the wakefulness phase, we actually stay awake. Um, I should say that before you flip back to stage one and just, you know, momentarily wake up, that's when you move into REM sleep, which I'll talk about in a second. So a very prominent question, I think it's already kind of been asked is what's the percentage of time you stay in these different cycles of sleep. Again, you know, what is really healthy? There's no such thing as a standardized answer. Everyone's a little different. But generally, the first cycle of this non-REM sleep takes about 90 minutes to two and a half hours. And you spend anywhere from like 75 minutes to 90 minutes in phase two 
and then you spend anywhere from 30 to 60 minutes in phase three, four. And then you go into REM sleep, which you can spend anywhere up to an hour, hour and a half in. And then the interesting thing about sleep too is that this pattern shifts through the night as the night progresses. So the second cycle after you've done your REM sleep, you spend proportionately less time in the non-REM sleep as the REM sleep. So say you're going to go through like four to five sleep cycles in a night. The first sleep cycle, you're spending like 90, about two hours in the non-REM sleep and an hour in the REM sleep. And by the time you get to the fourth cycle, you may spend less than an hour in the non-REM sleep and still be spending an hour in the REM sleep. So that just kind of how it progresses through the night. Um, and so depending on if you have disrupted sleep, you know, there's implications to that as to which, which sleep patterns you're missing out on, depending on, you know, your habits. Um, the REM sleep pattern stands for rapid eye movement. And that is because sleep scientists early on noticed that in this certain phase of sleep, that basically um, our eyes would have these rapid eye movements horizontally back and forth as our brain was in whatever part of sleep cycle we're in when we're unconscious. And that's the REM sleep. But the technical activity that is going on, gen and again, this is all generalizations, there's much more to it, but I could spend an hour and a half just talking about the physiology versus everything else I'm gonna talk about. So in the non-REM sleep or in the REM sleep, what's really being activated is the more primitive parts of our brain, the less rational and logical part of our brain, what we call the limbic system. The limbic system is where our emotional experience comes from, of feeling experience of life. And it, it is a part where usually what goes along with that is the experience of dreams. And the idea that we have these kind of just illogical, you know, impossible experiences in our dreams where basically we're integrating part of it is our conscious life, but part of it is our unconscious life that we experience wakefully and then historically, ancestrally, and all coming together in this really fascinating part of sleep called REM sleep where we're dreaming. And just like I kind of talked about phase two is like the, the, the filing work that the body's doing with rational kind of intellectual mental processes, you could say that that is what is somewhat being achieved in REM sleep with the dreaming phase, where we are essentially filing and making associations and organizing our emotional, spiritual experience of life. And that phase, even though we don't necessarily remember our dreams or draw them forward as stuff we carry into our conscious life, there's a really crucial purpose of that process happening. So you could also say that while non-REM sleep is restoring us physically, our brain function, and mentally our brain function, you could say that REM sleep is restoring our emotional function in our emotional capacity and reserves. Um, and in that process, um, you know, one thing that's super interesting, if you're willing to desiring to try it is doing sleep journaling or sleep recording with like your phone with the me voice memo setting. You can literally, when you wake up from a dream, record what's going on with it in as much detail as you can remember, either with a pen or with a voice recorder. And my belief system about that is that dreams actually have really amazing value to our conscious life. And that the themes that come up in dreams are things that are present in our, in our wakeful life, but not something we necessarily have consciousness around. So one way to kind of perpetuate your self-understanding curiosity and your growth path as a human could be to consider doing some dream journaling or dream recording and building up that information as a way to ponder and apply it to patterns you're consciously experiencing in your, in your wakeful life.
So just a little bit of an aside. Um, and so, you know, that is the nuts and bolts of sleep physiology and the sleep cycle. So we're going to spend a lot more time talking about what can go wrong, what are the implications of that, and then how can we go about fixing it. <clears throat> but that is, that's the general physiology of the sleep cycle. Okay, I'm not seeing any big questions, so I'm going to move forward and feel free to message them if you have them. So the next question I think is really, we're still on like healthy physiology is, what does really good sleep look like? What's the duration of it? Um, well, let's start there. I feel like on average, an optimal duration of sleep for the op for the average adult is between eight and nine hours a night. Some people need closer to the nine hour mark. Some people need closer to the eight hour mark. And consistently getting that much, I think, all of the research is pretty confirmatory on is really what, you know, this optimal restoration cycle is for humans. Now, interesting caveat, since we're here in the dead of winter, I would argue that we are more designed to stretch that out in the dark months of winter to more like nine to 10 hours and shorten that down to seven to eight in the summer. Chinese medicine has a lot to say about this, but that's the general concept of, you know, living in alignment and in relationship with nature. So if, I guess why I say that is if you find yourself feeling like you could sleep more in the winter and then cognitively getting like hard on yourself or critical of yourself for doing that, I don't think that's necessary. I think it actually, if you could afford that extra sleep in the winter and your body likes it and wants it, give it to it. And then in the summer, if you're not needing to sleep as much, don't stress about it as, oh, I'm not getting enough sleep. Recognize that that's working with the seasons and with your inherent connection to nature. Now, the really tricky thing comes, well, what if I sleep less in the summer, but I only still sleep, you know, seven or eight hours in the winter? Theoretically, the argument would go that you're not repositing that yin or like inward restorative energy in the winter to have the reserves to expend and sleep less in the summer. So yet having so much sun in the summer, sometimes we can't help but be cued by that. And so it, it can get a little tricky, but generally just know those fluctuations are a very real, I think worthwhile, true consideration to have regarding sleep duration. Um, falling asleep, again, a very different experience for everybody. Some people in a healthy way fall asleep instantly, practically. Some people in a healthy way take 15 or 20 minutes to fall asleep. Um, so there's nothing inherently wrong or right about that. Um, I would say if you're going beyond 20 minutes of, you know, needing to go from conscious to sleep, there may be a distortion pattern that we'll again talk about some of the potential causes of that later on. And then someone asked, you know, with their Fitbit app, how do you break down the percentages of sleep? I have a little pet peeve disclaimer to give here. I don't, those iWatches, you know, Fitbits, whatever the different wrist held devices, they're helpful. I think they can be a good tool. However, don't mistake the scientific accuracy of them for categorizing your sleep with how well you're actually sleeping. What they're gauging is an entirely inexact science and is highly variable and unreliable. So don't get really stressed about what your sleep numbers are saying. Ultimately, the only ways to really know about the quality of your sleep is to go get hooked up to an EEG machine electroencephalogram or a sleep study device and really track your sleep in a much more precise inpatient medical setting, which is impractical. So the way that you can do it functionally is work with how rested you're feeling in the morning, how rested your mind is, how rested your physical body is. And again, that's not even perfect because a lot of things influence that, not just how well we sleep through the night. So basically, 
I don't even like to talk about the percentages of those. I, I give those details about a healthy sleep cycle of non-REM and REM sleep in the approximate way we cycle through those, and then the approximate amount per night that is ideal, and kind of build off of that. <clears throat> So another thing about, you know, optimizing sleep is, again, it's fitting in with nature. When do you go to bed? When do you wake up? When is really ideal for that? <clears throat> so again, no right answer. It turns out that adolescents actually do better going to bed a little later and waking up quite a bit later. Um, adults do better going to bed a little earlier and waking up earlier. So there has been some good consensus science around that, but that even within that, there's individual differences. and then. I really generally think that kind of no matter what time of year to bed before 10 o'clock PM is a good rule of thumb. And that as an also general rule that eating at minimum, no less than two hours before you go to bed is also a good guidance point. Um, and I already talked about the number of hours, so that'll kind of dictate when you wake up. I mean, in a perfect world, when you're all the way rested, you don't need an alarm clock to wake up. That's also a good benchmark of, are you fully rested? Um, and so those are just kind of some more parameters. Um, yeah, I could talk about the different phases of life, like infants probably at night, 10 to 12 hours of sleep is ideal or once they're, once they're kind of sleep trained, um, same thing through toddlerhood. I think it's like, you know, ages five to kind of 12, that number can diminish a little bit, but you're still on a general higher sleep need until you kind of move through puberty. So generally, once you've completed puberty, you know, you kind of move into that adult zone of eight to nine hours, but I would say nine, 10, maybe even 11, 12 in the younger years is what we kind of need in an ideal world. Um, so I feel that those are really good, just baseline sleep health parameters. Um, what also comes with sleep is, um, like ideally our breathing happens through our nose, not through our mouth. Um, we, we rest better, um, our Dental health is better. Our architecture of our anatomy of our jaw and face is better if we breathe through our nose. So that's something that I ask on my intake. I sometimes ask is, do you breathe through your nose or mouth when you sleep? Because if you breathe through your mouth, it is less desirable and can lead to health concerns. Um, a couple of health concerns that are directly related to that is generally mouth breathing is much more associated with snoring, which is much more associated with interrupted sleep or sleep apnea. That's a big deal. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Mouth breathing is also associated with dental cavities, which are associated with a lot more systemic health issues. Mouth breathing is also associated with changing anatomy and architecture of the jaw and throat and mouth, which leads to other many other chronic health conditions. So it's a good thing to pick up on, especially if it's happening with kids. But even if you're an adult, that can be a good thing to try to address. Now, speaking of a treatment, one thing I'll just jump right out and saying is one of the simplest treatments is mouth taping. And so taping your mouth shut and forcing yourself to breathe out of your nose can be a very beneficial physiological practice and eventually the theory is when, you know, when you really learn to teach your body to do this, you don't have to keep taping your mouth. Um, and there are special kinds, you can look it up online, there are special kinds of tape adhesive to use to tape your lips together. Now, if you have really congested sinuses, of course, this is going to be um, problematic. And that's why the underlying cause sometimes you need to address is what's causing your sinus linings to be inflamed and boggy or what's causing you to have mucus and congestion in your sinuses. That's a whole nother lecture, a whole nother topic, something I definitely troubleshoot and analyze with folks. But obviously a lot of mouth breathing gets caused by that issue of not being able to breathe easily through your nose. And then 
someone asks, is it important to sleep on your back versus your side? Not really, unless you have these issues with snoring, with inflammation in your body, with sinus and mouth breathing, you know, swirl of symptoms. When you sleep on your back, if those issues are going on, if you have an inflamed, boggy upper palate in the back of your mouth toward your throat, then basically if you're on your back, that palate collapses while you're breathing and you can snore or even arrest your breathing, which is what sleep apnea is. And so for those individuals who are not nose breathers, but mouth breathers and are snoring, yes, sleeping on your side is one of the adaptations that can be very helpful. And you can do things as clever as wear like a shirt to bed that has a big felt ball on the back. So it's uncomfortable to sleep on your back. You have to sleep on your side. Um, you know, so that's, that's one thing to kind of acknowledge as, as a possibility. Um, yeah. So wanted to talk about those things and kind of, you know, breathing with sleep. Now let's go into actually talking about sleep disruption and the types of sleep disruption. And I want to just give a caveat at the beginning of that, which is to say that systemic chronic health conditions can be major causes of sleep disturbance. So for example, if you have severe heartburn, if you have severe arthritis or back pain, if you have um, an abdominal condition of, you know, constant continuous abdominal pain, if you have um, a major issues with your prostate or your kidneys and you're waking up, you know, 10 times a night, there are many systemic conditions that have nothing to do with sleep that can really harm the quality of your sleep. And so this lecture is, of course, not going to cover the breadth of that because that would be impossible. I mean, we could talk for a day about that and how to address those conditions. But just to say, if you have another physiological condition, chronic health condition that's causing disturbance to falling asleep or staying asleep or interrupting sleep, then that needs to be addressed and it needs to be tackled ideally with help and support and go see your naturopathic physician and get help with that. Don't just say, oh, well, I'm not sleeping, so I need to take a drug to sleep better. So that's just a caveat I'm going to put out there. Um, someone mentioned is tinnitus something like that. Yeah, I would say tinnitus can be something limiting sleep that's external to the sleep process itself. Although I would say with tinnitus, using a really loud white noise machine, which is a sleep hygiene tactic, can be really nice for that because it can kind of drown out the tinnitus and does not harmfully impact sleep. Okay. So what else can be wrong with sleep that's just like, before we talk about like more direct obstructions, one of the big ones is people who have a value system around sleep not being important. You know, like these big executives and high powered corporate positions and kind of the cultural stereotype that many of us have heard about how, you know, I don't have time to sleep, basically. This this concept that we literally don't permit ourselves to have this precious one third of our existence be dedicated to sleep and just how I've articulated why and how that is important to our body. So if you're just not allocating the time to sleep, then that in and of itself is its own hurdle to overcome. So changing your belief system and philosophy about that's really key and figuring out a way to allow that amount of sleep. Something that comes up as a question with that for many people is, well, can I make up sleep? So the science says that yes, but not completely. So if you sleep seven hours a night on the weekdays and 10 hours a night on the weekends, technically you're averaging eight hours, but is that fully making it up? Not quite, but also yes. So you do do some catch up by catching up if you're sleeping less, but like anything in life, it's always better to be consistent. So it's like, 
does taking a bunch of vitamin D since it's fat soluble, you know, help um, get your vitamin D levels up? Yes, but taking it every day is better. Does going on, you know, a 10 hour hike, you know, help get you more fit? Yeah, but probably going on a one hour hike every day would be better. So it's just kind of a like, you know, general, yes, you can make up sleep, but generally consistency is best. Um, so then when we really break down sleep disturbance patterns, assuming we're ruling out the choice to sleep enough, assuming we're ruling out systemic conditions that are the co actual cause of sleep disturbance, then we kind of break it down into two challenging sleep issues, falling asleep initially, and then staying asleep slash falling back asleep when we've woken at night. And I like to start this discussion in two prominent areas. One of the areas I like to discuss is sleep hygiene and what that means to me in terms of all of the demarcators of how you, the hygiene of how you live your life, both in preparation for sleep and in the environment of sleep to optimize the conditions for good sleep. And then number two, um, what is going on? What, it, what, does sleep disturbance patterns have to do with the mind? And so um, let me start talking about the mind first, because first of all, it's kind of a passion of mine as a physician. I love connecting the relationship of the mind to the body, helping people illuminate how profound that connection is and understanding how to heal ourselves in our body and how that heals our mind but equally important how healing our mind and how our mind operates and understanding it better can heal our physical body. And this is one of those areas is sleep is a big interface point in that because I, as a clinician, find that a huge, a huge percentage of sleep disturbance patterns, either falling asleep or staying asleep, have to do with disturbance and strain and conflict and stress in the mind, basically. And just the power of our mind dictating our physiology, one of the places that's true is if our mind is in a state of imbalance or strain, it won't allow us to fall asleep. Remember I said phase one of non-REM sleep is this transitionary moment. I think we can all appreciate the concept of the busy mind in the mind that is ruminating and revved up about either something in the future or something in the past that it won't let go of chewing on and how that can really delay our ability to activate sleep. And so I have found many people coming to me with sleep disturbance pattern issues, um, insomnia, you know, whatever diagnosis we want to give, we have to tackle it at that level. We have to really break down in individualized, intimate detail what's happening with their overactivated mind and what is what is driving that at a pattern level and what are the individual patterns and circumstances creating that let me give an example um if you're in a conflicted state with your spouse you're having marital disagreements similarly with your boss and you are dwelling and having irresolution and strain emotionally about that if you are overworked and have too much on your plate and you mentally and physically are overstraining and overtaxing yourself and revving yourself up into an adrenaline fueled overactivity of the mind, then your mind's going to have a hard time unwinding and coming to a place of restfulness, flipping into that sleep cycle. <clears throat> and and I actually want to take a minute <clears throat> to illustrate the physiology of sleep from a hormonal standpoint, because that's something I have not talked about yet. So it's important to understand this because we're tying it into the mind's activity. So when the mind is really active, it secretes catecholamines, which break down into adrenaline and cortisol. When cortisol and adrenaline are in high concentrations in our blood, it is the anti-sleep signal in our body. And hormones are big signals. So these are things that are, are very loud and very much 
prevent sleep. So if your mind is really activated and has a lot going on, it's saying it's not time to sleep. Okay. Um, whereas when you're in the rest and digest state, when your mind is kind of at peace and you're in the doing mode and you're in the being mode, all of those catecholamines, all that adrenaline and cortisol dissipates in your system and you're ready to go to sleep. You're sleepy. Um, and so it's really important to understand that about the mind-body connection. That is the hormonal interface there. So that's very different than basically what we're inherently designed to do. If you take away that mental stimulation response, we have this baseline hormonal rhythm to our body called a circadian rhythm. And I kind of alluded to it about we sleep at nighttime when it's dark and we're awake in daytime when it's bright out. And we have two primary um, hormonal systems involved there. We have the catecholamine cortisol pathway, and we have the serotonin, dopamine, tryptophan, um, melatonin pathway. They all kind of feed together, but melatonin particularly is the hormone we understand to really be at higher levels when we move into sleep. So if I was to draw it on a screen, we'd have at 4 to 6 a.m. cortisol peaking, and then 4 to 6 p.m. cortisol flattening out to baseline low levels through the night. And then we have with melatonin, lowest levels in the morning, 4 to 6 a.m., rising starting in the afternoon, evening, and peaking at about 8, 9 p.m. through the middle of the night. And these hormones, depending on their balance, have a lot to do with the ease in which we fall into sleepfulness and wakefulness. So cortisol alerts us and wakes us up in the morning and turns on our physiology of wakefulness. Um, so I kind of got a little sidetracked, but it, it's a big key component of the sleep-wake cycle. And when we work on sleep, we will think of that as a component to work on is our circadian wakeful, sleepful cycle, nighttime, daytime cycle, and how to support that appropriately. And which is why some of the people with some of the most chronic issues with sleep are people who have jobs that are night shifts, or people who have struggles with their toddlers, infants, or children in, you know, basically caring for them or caring for their dogs or whatever other, you know, house dwelling person at night that's disrupting this night night day sleeping pattern. And it kind of segues a different conversation is what about napping? And you know my 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 stance around napping is napping can be great. It depends on your individuality. So if you can still sleep at night and fall asleep and stay asleep well and wake rested and benefit from napping anywhere between 20 minutes to an hour, great. If napping screws up your sleep cycle, if napping makes you groggy, if napping makes it hard to fall asleep at night, then that might not be helpful for you. Um, so, you know, just kind of something to throw out there with the concept of napping. But generally, yes, if you can nap, I think it is restorative and it is helpful. And if you're missing out on a little sleep at night, doing some napping in the daytime can somewhat make up for it. But again, not completely because you don't get to go through those beautiful layered sleep cycles like I described at the beginning of the lecture, okay? So cycling back out to our conversation about what can be disrupted about sleep, I wanna go back to the mind and say, when the mind is carrying irresolution, whether it, that has to do with mental overactivity or emotional strain and irresolution, then it can be one of the major precipitators of um, not allowing that phase one of sleep to initiate. And so when I see that, then getting at the causal level of the disturbance has a lot to do with understanding how someone is with their mind, how they relate to the forces going on in their life, and teaching skills and confronting belief systems and patterns around that. So often we'll do some psychotherapy counseling around it, <laughs> um, or we'll build in practices 
that help us actually learn how to let go of the mind's emotional or mental activity that we're chewing on, preventing us from dropping into sleep. Breath work or visceral or abdominal breathing is probably the fundamental practice that is the simplest to apply. One of the ways I will teach that is either four square breathing, breathing in from the nose, out from the nose or mouth, and counting to four, holding for four, breathing out for four, holding for four. So it's a counting exercise. Or just even more simply, counting each deep abdominal inhalation all the way into your abdomen, counting up to 10 with each breath, and then restarting the count after 10. And what I find when people actually, you know, take full responsibility and um, agency in this practice is that they deal, they do, they sleep better. Their sleep patterns improve. It doesn't happen overnight. And especially because the mind does not want to let go of its activity. So you may be really struggling and straining against that and having a lot of intrusive thoughts for quite a long time, probably even forever as you practice this. But over time and with practice, you do learn and improve your ability to let go of the mind's grappling onto your unconsciousness and be more in your body, which is what catapults you into the phase one of sleep. And so that is number one in sleep practices to encourage that can be so helpful. Now, obviously, if you have a really straining situation in life, you have a really traumatic experience that you're stuck around, that probably is going to involve more than simple breath work. And that's why I allude to the idea of in sessions, sometimes with my patients, that's really crucial to explore with them and support them through different techniques in clearing some of those stuck patterns or empowering them to make actions of their in their lives to change their environment emotionally or relationally with themselves or others. Um, so I think that that's going to be, you know, just something big to acknowledge. And for me is, is, is frontline. That being said, um, I will then next talk about sleep hygiene, which I feel like is the next biggest, most important thing to dive into when we're really looking at the anatomy of sleep and what conditions to put in place to sleep well. Again, with this belief system that if we put the right conditions for health in place, the body knows what to do. And, and my argument is a lot of people's sleep issues is because they have poor hygiene around sleep. So let me kind of go through that. And by the way, if you want a, hygiene, a sleep hygiene handout, I think I have posted that to our website under the resources section. So you can kind of review this in much more detail. First thing I'll talk about is exercise. Love, love, love the physiological benefits of exercise for a million different reasons. One of the really good reasons to exercise is sleep. So when we, when we exercise, we reorganize all those stress hormones, we move our blood, we clear toxins out of our brain, we retone our nervous system and muscles, and we actually, you know, help make our bodies and minds more tired, which it turns out pretty important to sleep well. So daily exercise is hugely beneficial. Now, it does not always have to be a certain time. Many people I recommend first thing in the morning, but it can also be done at night as long as it's gentle. But having some sort of sleep practice is crucial. Um, so that, or sorry, sleep practice, exercise practice is crucial. So big part of sleep hygiene. Another side part of sleep hygiene that I actually think is a pretty big deal is going to sleep and waking up at the same time every day, or at least close to building a habit. The older we get, the more habituated and responsive to routines and habits our bodies are. So if we struggle with sleep and our sleep is you know, we're going to bed and waking up all over the place, then I believe that that is a huge, you know, obstacle to fixing our sleep issues. So beginning your night ritual, if you have a ritual at nine, wanting to fall asleep by 10, that's really important. You just do the same thing every day and wake up at the same time every day. And so generally 
this practice is key. It's really important when we teach kids how to sleep, right? So we have to do that with ourselves. Um, there can, of course, be exceptions, social things and, you know, disrupting our sleep pattern, but generally having the same commitment day in, day out to two bed, two wake time is really important. Additionally, I already kind of mentioned the eating, that if we eat less than two hours before bedtime, that we have a danger of disrupting our sleep cycle, both from the standpoint of like, we'll be in a really active digestive phase, which is not so good for allowing the phases of sleep to happen because our body's using too much resources digesting, but also because of how it affects blood sugar levels and then compensatorily blood sugar and cortisol levels, which are that stress hormone. So again, I'm not gonna go too deep here because there's a lot to it, but if we have a high carb meal, especially if it's close to bedtime, then what's going to happen is our blood sugar is going to spike. And then an hour and a half later, it's going to totally bottom out. And then following that, we're going to secrete a bunch of cortisol, which remember that's the hormone that wakes us up to restabilize our blood sugar. So that cycle can get pretty vicious with blood sugar and how it wakes us up and how we stay awake. Cause then we have too much cortisol in our system. We have a lot of cortisol it's really hard for us to fall asleep. So generally, too, being having issues with blood sugar and issues with sugar and carbohydrate can be really problematic for sleep. It's a really good place to introduce the concept of alcohol here because the same issue is there with alcohol. Alcohol is sugar. And when we drink alcohol, it has this extra nasty effect of being a toxin. And so one of the bedrock hygienic things about people with sleep issues is don't drink alcohol. It may help you paradoxically fall asleep to kind of numb your busy mind, but its rebound effect is dysregulating your blood sugar and your liver and spiking your cortisol and waking you up at night. So that is something that I will very much assess for in sleep disturbance issues and really advise strongly against if people are having sleep issues. Um, People who have known blood sugar issues or known adrenal issues, um, which is where the stress hormone cortisol is made, they actually may sometimes benefit from a very small handful of nuts or a little nut butter with some apple right before bed, like no more than an eighth to a quarter of a cup. But that actually is because it's a balanced starch, fat, protein, food that can keep the blood sugar stable for people who have especially big issues with blood sugar. And that's, again, that's kind of more of a systemic issue to work on, but I'm just saying there are exceptions to the not eating for three hours for sleep. Another thing is ambient noise or lack thereof, whether you use a white noise machine or whether you have it really quiet in your room, whatever allows not having auditory distraction. That's really important because that can wake us up and disrupt our sleeping. Um, TV can have, right, like noise, which again, I do not consider that ambient noise. So let me be clear. Ambient noise to me is like a white noise machine. I like using one that's more mechanical. DOHM is one that I recommend a lot, dome, rather than using your phones or, or like white noise sleep apps, although that's okay too. Um, and so really having that hygiene good in that regard, also light levels, this is a big deal. So having your room blackout curtains, completely dark where you sleep is really important. How sensitive our visual systems are to cueing light versus darkness. Um, it kind of goes into segues into one of my treatments I use a lot to help improve sleep and sleep weight cycles, which is besides having total darkness at night. Um, you can use a full spectrum light. I use one called Verilux, V-E-R-I-L-U-X. It's called a happy light. It's like $60. I'll just turn mine on to show how bright it is on my face. It's like a little tablet. They're nice and thin and low profile, but you can use those in the morning to turn on all your wakefulness hormones, all of your pineal gland stimulation through the retina of your eyes 
activates those wakefulness hormones and helps that melatonin cortisol balance be more appropriate. Um, the, the, the medical use of these is they, they, they need to be direct light. You don't have to stare into it, but it can't be behind your head or something. It needs to be less than 20 inches from your face. And I use it within two hours of waking for at least 30 minutes. So those are great tools, especially in the winter months to kind of, to keep us in a better emotional state, but also a better sleep wake cycle. Um, same opposite goes for nighttime. You don't want to use one of these happy lights at night. You also don't want to use other devices that essentially do the same thing as these lights, which are the blue lights and the LED lights that we get from our cell phone screen, computer screens, and TV screens. So I always counsel for at least an hour before you want to go to bed, get away from those LED blue lights for at least an hour. So whatever ritual and routine you have to support that, that's a hygienic thing you can change. I also encourage um, EMF hygiene, meaning electromagnetic frequencies, anything that are plugged into the wall, any routers to your modems, any electromagnetic frequencies passing through where you sleep can agitate and de destabilize your brain's theta waves that are associated with dropping you into the phases of sleep cycles. So we're removing those, keeping your phone out of your bedroom, removing those electromagnetics. That's a great strategy. Okay. Um, also something to note about is be careful with caffeine for sleep hygiene. Some people are very sensitive to caffeine, even if they have it in the morning. Some people are definitely sensitive if they have it later in the day. If they have it past noon or certainly in the evening, it will just diminish your ability to fall asleep. Um, another subtle but important you know, tip is have a glass of water before you have a glass of coffee in the morning and wait at least 30 minutes after you wake up to when you start drinking coffee. This is because we want the natural cortisol that elevates our wakefulness to come on before we drop the caffeine in that artificially stimulates that and dysregulates our system and makes us crash later in the day. So just a little tip to give there. Um, in all sorts of caffeine, right? Like the energy drinks and the coffee are the most concentrated or caffeine pills, but you also have caffeine in other types of products. So look for it. Even, you know, those zip fizz, they have a Costco of like hundred milligrams caffeine. That's like drinking a 16 ounce coffee. Um, gentler caffeines like green tea, um, jasmine tea, I think much less disturbing to sleep. They also have calming compounds in them. Um, so sleep hygiene, is there anything else I want to mention about that? Because it's really important. I really value it. Um, I'm just going to make sure I'm actually going to pull my article right up here. Um, yeah, you, it's, it's really nice to kind of do a pre-sleep routine. It, you know, like we, again, I always go back to babies because some babies end up sleeping much better if they have this consistent routine of they're going to get a bath. They're going to have a book read. It's like, do that same for yourself, you know, take a bath, read a book, um, do something really calming and grounding and make, make, um, a ritual about that. Um, yeah, I think that covers my basis for all my sleep hygiene. So I do want to make sure to leave some space in this lecture to talk about actual interventional nutrients and strategies. Yes, there are many great tools that I can deploy, but only after we look at these more fundamental patterns and causes, okay? So if we go into a little more direct, what can I do take to induce sleep better? So top of my list is magnesium. Magnesium has many health benefits. There's a million reasons to use it. It is one of its major actions is calming to the central nervous system. Central nervous system needs to be calm in order for us to fall asleep. And so I recommend a magnesium glycinate malate by a company called Vital Nutrients. I recommend it because it is way more absorbed than other kinds of magnesium. And if we don't absorb it, it's not going to act on our central nervous system. 
so it's a much more efficiently utilized kind of magnesium. I will recommend anywhere between 250 and 400 milligrams at night. I tell everybody to take magnesium. It's There's no reason not to take it, and there are many reasons to take it, not just sleep. And I find that about 70% of people notably state their sleep is better when they take magnesium, either tremendously better or somewhat better. And so, and it's not habit forming. I would just recommend everybody use it. Um, so that is the number one nutrient. Now, when we talk about melatonin, we're kind of getting into working with the hormonal conversation about that whole circadian rhythm and cortisol melatonin. So there's a whole class of nutrients that targets that pathway. Melatonin is the direct hormone. However, because it's a hormone, it's a very powerful substance. I am very leery of recommending high doses of melatonin because of its propensity to cause brain adaptation and then ultimately dependency. So I'm really only comfortable daily recommending up to three milligrams and I like a sustained release two milligram version the best because then it kind of drops that melatonin in through the night. It's made by a company called Claire Labs is the one we use. And yes, melatonin can work well for some people at nighttime. But again, I like to do these sleep hygiene things. Those are great for melatonin in a more natural way. Um, I actually find if we're going to use nutrients to work on these pathways, a couple of even better acting ones. If I suspect people's cortisols are being spiked at night, the wakefulness hormone, which again, many causes of that, we kind of got into a little bit, but I'll use a product called Cortisol Manager, which has two really helpful compounds in it. One is called ashwagandha. That's an herb that tends to calm the adrenals, calm the, the stress-mediated hormones. And phosphatidylserine is a nutrient that has the same action. So the combo of those or just one or other of those alone can often be really helpful for sleep in that way of suppressing the activating stress hormones, um, which may be a little bit elevated at night for some folks. And the people with the real active mind, the professionals, go, 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 busy, busy moms or parents, you know, this is the kind of thing that I might consider would really be beneficial. Um, L-tryptophan I actually find for a lot of people is more effective than melatonin. And it's in that same pathway, tryptophan turns into 5-HTP, which turns into serotonin, which turns into melatonin. So that's kind of the synthetic pathway. I like giving the main precursor tryptophan because it has many different kind of steps to synthesis and it helps all of those pathways along. But I can prescribe up to 1500 milligrams at night. I usually start with a thousand milligrams and sometimes people do very nicely with that. Um, 5-HTP is a little more potent of a substance. I kind of think of it as a more drug-like action. It's just much more concentrated in the other nutrients. Same pathway, but I might think of 5-HTP for people who have really like significant intractable sleep issues or where they're like, we're really needing them to get sleeping better so that we can make other inroads. We might for a time use this. I use a formula called Insomnitol that has 5-HTP with some other um, nutrients and herbs in it. Um, but the dosing there, I would not go over 100 milligrams and I would be very careful about using that. Um, then we get brought into the realm of herbs, um, Western medical herbs that are what are called the, the herbal category is called hypnotics or sedatives. Um, a few of my favorites are kava kava can be really good herb for sleep. Lemon balm can be a nice herb for sleep. Passion flower can be a nice herb for sleep. Valerian, which many of us have probably heard of, can be a really nice herb for sleep. I'm not going to go over dosing instructions and, you know, milligram concentrations. It kind of depends on the person. It can be taken in tincture versus it can be taken in capsule. But those can sometimes work really nicely. Um, some people do really well with GABA or theanine. GABA is a calming neurotransmitter. Theanine works on calming neurotransmitters. Those can be nice to be taken at night. 
and then also um, lavender as an herb, but also as a topical. Putting lavender on your pillow, spraying it in a mist, like those can really induce sleep nicely. Um, and one way talking about topicals, I should have mentioned with magnesium, Epsom salts, which are a topical version of magnesium in baths, really good way to get magnesium into your system. So transdermally, three or four cups of Epsom salts in a bath at night is just a great way to knock someone out often. So you could make a ritual on that. Um, so I'm really kind of just rapid firing, covering a lot of bases with my nutrients that I like to deploy. But I think that gives a good breadth of things. Now, the last category, which is a very personal passion and love of mine is homeopathy. Homeopathic medicines are very subtle and they're very kind of energetic in nature. But what they do, I find, is they work more deeply at a pattern level. And so the scope of this lecture is a little too defined to go into a lot of different specific homeopathic remedies. Although there is one combo remedy you can get over the counter called Calms Forte at the health food stores. Mm -hmm. Taking two tablets of that under the tongue at night can really help some people falling asleep. Also, I'll mention a couple of other common remedies I use. Arsenicum album, 30C, for people with anxiety about the future and generalized anxiety about health. <clears throat> and of self and loved ones. Really nice for sleep issues when that mental process is related. Pophia 30C, which yes, is coffee, but in a homeopathic form for people with very agitated, busy minds <clears throat> that just won't shut off. Really beneficial. And then Cali Foss 30C for people with an overwhelmed, overstimulated, kind of environment that's going on with their life that's bleeding into their sleep world and their mind can be really nice for sleep as well. So those are a few potentials, but always with homeopathy, I say, talk to your naturopathic physician or your homeopath and find the best remedy that suits your presentation. And lots of times those sleep specific things aren't even going to work. What people need is their constitutional whole person remedy. The other remedy I find really helpful if your rumination or active mind is dwelling a lot on the past is one called Nature Muriaticum or Nat M 30C. So that can be really good in that circumstance. So just want to kind of toss out homeopathic interventions as well. And, you know, kind of wrap up our case there. I, I know we didn't get to talk about um, sleep apnea too much. It's kind of its own topic. It's a really big deal, really big problem in our society. Bottom line, if you snore a lot, if your partner knows you have super interrupted breathing, it's something to get looked into. Um, and if you wake up really unrested, but you think you're sleeping through the night, but you're super unrested, it might be something that needs to be explored. And there are really easy ways to do at-home sleep studies I have lots of resources for my patients to access those. Um, so again, sleep apnea is, is a topic related to sleep we didn't get to today, but super important to connect to that world of things. And so hopefully as we wrap out here, you all just have more insight, more knowledge, more ideas, more intentions to apply to your life if sleep is something you want to focus on um, to really you know, optimize and enhance this really core determinant of health. And I'm happy to share my knowledge and passion about it in this very restful season where sleep is our one of our best friends to support us through the dark days of winter. So thank you for dropping in. I don't see any additional questions and I'm always welcome um, any sort of uh, email outreach, additional questions, topic ideas for the future and appreciate those of you who attended in person to be there to have an audience to uh, have in front of me and listen. It means a lot. So thanks for the privilege. Okay. Goodbye, everyone.